Uh, good morning, everyone. I'm Councilwoman Susan Berland, and welcome to our uh, annual Anne Frank Memorial Garden event. So if everybody can please rise for the presentation of colors and join the Jewish War Veterans Post 488 as they bring the colors down to us. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, please join the Jewish War Veterans Post 488 for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Gentlemen, please post the colors. Thank you, everybody. Please be seated. Let's have a round of applause for our Jewish war veterans, post 48. Thank you, gentlemen, for being here. Incredibly appreciated. We thank you for being here today, and we thank you for your service. Well, ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to uh, thank you all for being here for the fifth annual celebration at the Anne Frank Memorial Garden. This would have been Anne Frank's 86th birthday. So we're here today to pay tribute to Anne's legacy of wisdom and her genuine belief in the goodness of mankind and human nature. And she had this belief despite the ugliness of war and the ugliness of discrimination. May her words and her insight continue to teach and inspire us for generations to come. We gather here this afternoon to honor the memory of this courageous young woman and the legacy she left behind. Anne was full of wisdom far beyond her years. The keen observations she recorded in her diary reflect an unwavering optimism and an unwavering faith, a faith in mankind, despite her living through one of the most unspeakable tragedies in history. In 1947, Anne's father, Otto Frank, published her diary. It has since been translated into 67 languages, which allows citizens worldwide to be moved by her strength, courage, and perseverance, regardless of language, culture, or religion. It cuts straight to the heart and speaks of life, love, and humanity. I'd like to share with you one of my favorite quotes from Anne Frank. How wonderful it is that nobody need wait a single moment before starting to improve the world. Well, I think that's a, it's a great sentiment and a great thought, and let us all try to do one thing to improve the world. Let me make a couple of introductions of uh, some people we have here today. First and foremost, we have uh, Rabbi Yaakov Sachs from the Chai Center, who is here. We have uh, Hazan Brian Baruch Shamash of the South Huntington yeah. Jewish Center, yeah. who is here. He's back there, he's going to be coming up. <laughs> and, uh, and his uh, ensemble, who are going to provide our musical selections. And then we have uh, our, our incredible keynote guest speaker, Evelyn Pike Rubin, who is joining us. All right, so let's start the program. Let me introduce to you Rabbi Yaakov Sachs from the High Center of Dix Hills for our invocation. So, mighty God, the Father of all mankind, regardless of race, religion, sex, or creed, we pause on this day to honor Anna and Frank, a prolific young lady, young girl, who they say probably died of typhus at a concentration camp run by the Nazis, February, March of 1945. Anne wrote the following poignant thought in her diary. I finally realized that I must do my schoolwork to keep from being ignorant, to get on in life, to become a journalist, because that's what I want. I can write, but it remains to be seen whether I really have talent. I want to be useful or bring enjoyment to people that I've never met. I want to go on living even after my death. 
And that's why I'm so grateful to God to have given me this gift, which I can use to develop myself and to express all that is inside of me. So we say to you, Anne, on your birthday, yes, we have learned much from you, and we still do, even after your death, and we thank you. However, Anne, we still have much to learn. As the former chief rabbi of Israel, Rabbi Yisrael Meila, once said, the Holocaust taught us, taught us how to die with one another. And now it is time for us to learn to live with one another. And so therefore we pray to God to reduce prejudice, foster respect and tolerance between one another. We ask your assistance in helping us determine what is free speech and what is bias. Grant the wisdom to the leaders of our town, our county, our state, our country. The faith and courage to stand up to fight against those who would hurt us. Al-Qaeda, ISIS, neo-Nazis, the KKK, and others who hate us strictly because of sex, religion, race, or creed. In addition, we pray that the coalition of soldiers who are fighting the aforementioned Al-Qaeda, etc., and other terrorists, that they arrive home safely without their outlook of others being tainted by experience abroad. In conclusion, we ask you, God, to hasten the fulfillment of the visions of our prophets, where it says, where the work of the righteousness shall be peace, and its effect, tranquility and security forever, where nation should not lift up the sword against nation, and neither, or neither, depends where you're from, shall they learn war anymore. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Rabbi Sachs. Now I'd, I'd like to introduce Hassan Brian Baruch Shamash of the South Huntington Jewish Center and his ensemble for a musical selection. Hassan? <laughs> I am proud. 
proud, can't you see? For at last I am free. No more wandering. No more wandering. For me. to you our guest speaker, Evelyn Pike Rubin. Evelyn is an activist, an author, and a lecturer who in 1939, in the age of eight, fled Germany with her family to Shanghai, China. Her memoir, Ghetto Shanghai, chronicles her life of survival among more than 18,000 Jewish refugees in Japanese-occupied Shanghai during World War II. She has dedicated her adult life to Jewish causes on Long Island, serving as Vice President for Social Action of the Jericho Jewish Center, and as past president of her Temple Sisterhood and the Center's Hebrew School Parents Council. And I know for a fact she's a lovely mother of two great, oh, there's four, oh, wait a minute. You know two. I know two, I know two. Where, where are the other two? Okay, they're not here. Okay, well I know two of them who I went to high school with. I guess I wasn't going to high school with all four of them, but I know two for sure who are here. So uh, it is my honor, privilege, and absolute pleasure to introduce to you Evelyn Pike Rubin. Elizabeth, the talking hat, or I'm not wearing a hat. Yeah. yeah. But then they can't see me. Does this come off? I see you. We can see you. We're good. We're good. Yeah. We can see you. They said they can see you. They can see me. Those are my kids. They see me all the time. Yes. I see you. I got you. Can they? Okay. Can you hear me and see me? Yeah. You want it to come off? No, no, that's all right. Okay. Okay, that'll do. If you can't hear, <coughs> I, I'm, I just came back from China and I'm still slightly jet lagged. Okay. Get organized. Just I'll make a slight correction. My, my family. You, you went to school with <coughs> two of my daughters, right, Cheryl? And, yeah, and Cheryl Doreen. And Doreen. Right. Well. I also have another daughter and a son. I have 12 grandchildren and two great grandchildren. Okay? So I'm bringing you up to date. And two of my grandchildren are here my married granddaughter with my uh, son, uh, grandson in law and uh, Erica. Oh, three grandchildren Erica and uh, Jordan. That's so, the good thing about having so many. You're that's like, right. There's always somebody around. That's why I did it that way. So I'll never be alone, that's right? right. That's a good idea. Because I am an only child. So I made, I made up for it. Uh, as I mentioned to you, I just got back from, uh, from China. I was a speaker at a, uh, a Turo Law Conference in Shanghai, and it was a fabulous, fabulous trip. But that's not what I'm going to talk about, just mentioning it in passing, because I grew up in Shanghai. And let me uh, tell you why it is that my family and I ended up in Shanghai and survived there under Japanese occupation. I, I was born in uh, 1930 in Breslau, Germany. 
to an Orthodox Jewish family. You might call them an anachronism. They were Orthodox, ardent Zionists, and patriotic Germans, all at the same time. My uh, mother came from a Talmudic family. My father came from an Orthodox family. He was a soldier in the First World War. And uh, when he came back home after receiving a bunch of medals from the Kaiser, having been wounded uh, during the Battle of Verdun, having been a prisoner of war of the French, he found out that his home in uh, Yaruchin, Germany, had been given to Poland under the Versailles Treaty. He and his family had to leave. Uh, I either uh, change their nationality to Polish or retain the German nationality. They chose to leave, and that's how my parents met. During the First World War, my mother, uh, Jewish Orthodox female, decided to start her own business because she felt uh, as the, uh, she was the youngest of seven. Her two brothers had become rabbis, two had uh, gone into business, her sisters had gotten married, and she wanted to better herself a little bit. She started during the First World War a paper and twine business, and by the time she met and married my father in 1929, she had a flourishing business with dozens of salesmen going throughout Germany. My father came into the business, but he became a director of sales. He did not become her partner. It was her business, which she ran very, very well. And because both my parents went to business, I had what they'd call a kinder mädchen, today it's called a nanny, who took care of me. Of course, the business closed at one o'clock on Friday, and uh, we went to synagogue Friday night, Saturday, and of course, of all the, all the holidays. Uh, when Hitler came to power, uh, right, via, right at the time, my uh, father, being a German patriot, having fought for his country, decided to hang the flag of the Weimar Republic out of the window. And he only took it down when the Jewish landlord of the apartment house we were living in came in and asked him to do so. He says, there's only one kind of flag you're allowed to hang out the window. You have to take that flag in. And that's when my parents, I guess, realized there's been a change. However, my mother, who was always a realist, and my father, who was always an optimist, couldn't quite agree what to do. My mother thought we should leave Germany right then and there. My father said, listen, I was a soldier, I fought for, the, for this country. There have been pogroms before, there have been massacres before, there's been the Spanish Inquisition. That too shall pass. This madman is not going to last. Well, by 1934, it looked like uh, not only was he going to last, but things were getting worse for the Jews in Germany. I was taking swimming lessons and the signs went up, no Jews allowed. I was taking ice skating lessons and the signs went up at the park, no Jews allowed. My uh, parents used to take their winter vacations at the one kosher hotel uh, from that part of Germany in the um, Czechoslovakia, the German Sudetenland, where they went skiing and I was going sleigh riding. In 1930, Four, my parents told me, well, next year you will take your first skiing lessons and we're going to go on this vacation again. Well, we did not know that this was going to be our last vacation in uh, Czechoslovakia or anywhere out of Germany. The Germans decided to make a change in the passport of the Jews. Uh, we still had our so-called German citizenship, but there was a change in the passport. This is a copy of my, uh, and a large copy, obviously, of my mother's passport. And from the front, it looked the same as any other German passport, except for two editions. One you can see very prominently, the red J. The other one you cannot quite see as prominently. All Jews had to add a middle name uh, to their regular name. All Females had to add the name Sarah, and all males had to add the name Israel. So here my mother's 
made a middle name now became Sarah. Because just in case somebody would look at the passport and miss the red J, they would see the middle name right in there. So they made sure that this was very visible. This was this is the inside of my mother's passport with her picture. Over here it says Kinder, Children, and it says Evelyn Sarah. I had to have that too. And by the way, we had to file an application to get permission to use that na uh, middle name. Leaving uh, Germany till approximately 1940 was never a problem. The problem was in order to leave Germany, you had to show the Germans that you were immigrating somewhere, in other words, exile and never coming back. Therefore, you can't take a vacation because if you take a vacation, you leave and you come back. So by 1935, my parents saw that they had to leave Germany and they were looking for countries to let us in. As I mentioned, my mother had a very flourishing business. The monies were there to write our own affidavit for the United States. However, it was in the wrong currency. You had to have your monies either in pound sterling, British pound sterling, or American dollars. Our monies was in German marks, which was unacceptable to the American government or anywhere else in order to get a visa. I would be coming home from school and I'd hear all these strange languages because my parents were hoping to go to different countries. To Palestine via their British mandate, they were learning English. Uh, to hoping to go to Cuba, they were studying Spanish. Hoping to go to Brazil, they were studying Portuguese, but to no avail. My one remaining grandmother was my father's mother. My great grandfather had been uh, a traveling uh, tradesman and he had been traveling over different parts of the world and on one of his trips, he had taken my grandmother's older sister with him and had stopped in the United States. And his daughter stayed in New York and married an American Jew. Uh, my grandmother was corresponding with her sister and asked her to send us an affidavit to come to the United States. It was approximately 1936. And uh, unfortunately, the reply she got back from her sister was, don't you know, America is in a depression. I cannot sponsor you. One of my mother's brothers had gone into a, a related business of my mother's in Breslau. And when Hitler came to power, he rang our doorbell late one evening. He says, it is the end for the Jews in Germany. I'm having my chauffeur drive me through Switzerland into France, the uh, land of liberty. I'm going to live there and establish another business. I think you should go with us. Uh, well, my parents decided not to go with him, but he was in France. So my father, who spoke French fluently, which he had uh, learned while he was a prisoner of war, asked the French for a visa to visit him to see if he could get papers to immigrate to France. He was refused a visa because he was only the brother-in-law. My mother, who spoke a very halting French, was given a visa, however, because she was the sister. And approximately 1936, 1937, she went to Paris to stay with her brother and to appeal to the French government for papers for us to immigrate to France. She was refused. Of course, in retrospect, it was the best thing that could have happened. My uncle, unfortunately, was picked up during the Valdiv Roundup in 1942 and sent to Auschwitz. But in the meantime, we had no place to go. At the beginning of 1938, we had to deliver all our jewelry, precious stones, sterling, gold, whatever we had, to the Nazis. And they, very, being very meticulous, gave receipts for everything. Of course, having a kosher home, we had uh, all kinds of flatware for dairy and meat uh, for the holidays and for Passover. So there was a lot that we had to deliver to them, as well as all uh, my mother's jewelry, my grandmother's jewelry, and we were all allowed to keep one gold watch, and my parents were allowed to keep their gold wedding band. Uh, we still had no place to go, and then came the Anschluss, the annexation of Austria. In Austria at the time, there was a um, Chinese consul who saw what was happening to the Jews in Austria. 
and he decided on his own to give out visas for Shanghai, hoping not just that people would go to Shanghai, but once they have a visa, they might be able to get into other countries. Now that was in Austria, but word came to Germany that one could go to Shanghai, that one could go to Shanghai without papers. He was giving visas to Austrian Jews, but we had heard you could go to Shanghai without papers. The Japanese were the occupying forces at the time. They had been the victors of the Sino-Japanese War of 1937 and had occupied Shanghai, one of the places that they did not occupy all of China, just a certain part, but Shanghai was occupied by them. And uh, there seemed to be no restriction to go to Shanghai. In the meantime, my recalcitrant great aunt sent an affidavit that came about the middle of 1938 uh, because the HIAS in New York, an organization still in existence today, the Hebrew Immigrant Aid Society, told people who had relatives in Europe, if you will sign the papers, we will take care of the people. They will not be a burden on to you. And under those conditions, my great aunt signed the affidavit and we received a quota number to go to the United States. It all sounded very good, it was in 1938, except there was one huge fly in the ointment called the American Quarter System. The American Quarter System was established approximately 1921, 1922, and it stated in part, you belong to that quota where the city of your birth was physically located in 1922. Under the Versailles Treaties, my father's home Jarocin was physically located in Poland, even though it had been Germany when he was born. He was a German soldier, had a German passport, was never Polish. We were on Polish quota. And when uh, the American government told us, on German quota there's room, you could leave immediately. Polish quota is filled, we'll give you a number. So my parents dismantled the beautiful big apartment that we had, and with three uh, moved into three rooms with, together with my grandmother, who had come to live with us after Hitler came to power, with our bags packed, hoping that if we should get permission in any other country in the world to go to, we could leave with our bag packed immediately. Beginning of November 1938, my mother decided to take a trip to Berlin, to the, where the American consulate was located, to see what the status of our visa was. Just about the same time, there was a young man in Paris by the name of Herschel Grinspan, whose parents were living in Hanover, Germany. They had been expelled from Poland for being stateless. And Germany says, you're stateless, you have to go back to Poland. And Poland wouldn't take them back. They were in limbo. He was studying at, studying at the Sorbonne, became very despondent, and decided to take matters into his own hands. He purchased a pistol, went up to the American embassy, uh, to the uh, German embassy in Paris, and decided to shoot the first official whom he saw. Ne not necessary to kill him, but just to make a point. The unfortunate person was Ernst von Rath, the foreign minister, and he did get wounded. And the Germans let it be known, should Ernst von Rath die, there would be severe reprisals against the Jews of Germany. Ernst von Rath died November 8th, 1938, and the reprisal was Kristallnacht, the following day, November 9th, 1938. My mother was in Berlin. I was home with my grandmother and my father and the young girl who was going to walk me to school every morning. I had had permission from the Germans to attend the public schools because Jewish children of veterans were permitted to do so. However, my parents had decided to send me to a private Jewish school. So when she came in to walk me to school, she says, I don't think there'll be school today. There's something going on. I see fires, I hear broken glass, smashes, and so on. Well, as uh, history has uh, taught you, and which I'm sure you've heard, heard or read about, uh, Kristallnacht was when the Germans went on a rampage. And they smashed uh, Jewish uh, shop win shops. They burned synagogues all over Germany and Austria also. 
and then they started to arrest all Jewish males above the age of 18 to incarcerate them in the then existing concentration camp, Buchenwald, Dachau, and Sachsenhausen. These camps were at that time not yet extermination camps. They were strictly camps which housed uh, uh, dissidents that Hitler didn't like from the time that he came into power. So when, my, when the girl came in, my father says, you know, I think I'll take you to a, f a friend's house. He put on the radio and all he heard was martial music. And he took me over to a friend's house. He left the girl with my grandmother and he went into hiding at the Christian landlords at our place of business. In the meantime, uh, my mother came back from uh, Berlin because very fruitless mission to Berlin because the moment that the first synagogue was put to the torch, the American consulate gave out no more visas. In the meantime, my father came out of hiding on November 11th when Goebbels made an announcement that this action that they called was over. He came into the apartment house where he had left me with friends and the Gestapo happened to be in the building. He was arrested and sent to the Buchenwald concentration camp. So when my mother found out that's where he was, together with a friend whose husband was also in Buchenwald, she decided to take matters into her own hands. She went to Hamburg to the um, Nippenschusen Kaiser Line, a Japanese shipping line, and bought tickets for three of us to go to Shanghai the following February. My grandmother had refused to go. She did follow a year later, but at that point she had refused to go so my mother bought the three tickets. My father had never wanted to go to Shanghai. He wanted to wait for the visa for the United States. A lot of people did not want to go to Shanghai. I just came back from Shanghai. It was a very long flight. We went on a beautiful plane. We were very comfortable, but uh, we knew where we were going. We knew we were gonna stay in a nice hotel, and we, we knew where things were because we watched television, we read newspapers, and we know exactly what happens on the other side of the world. But put yourself uh, into the eyes of a Western European, a Jewish Western European particularly, in 1938, where we had newspapers and radio, but the Orient seemed not just 8,000 miles away, which it was, but it seemed like uh, another world totally. And people weren't about to pack up and go. Yet there were people who were considering it. My father was not one of them. However, my mother had taken matters into her own hands. On her birthday, December 5th, 1938, the doorbell rang at six in the morning. My father was there. Uh, the Nazis had decided to start releasing people from that particular aktion, the Kristallnacht aktion, slowly in bits and pieces. Uh, every day a few here, a few there. He was among the first to be released. He had to sign up with the Gestapo every morning that he and his family would leave Germany within two months or we'd all end up in a concentration camp. And as my mother told me in later years, I was only eight years old at the time, so it didn't mean very much to me, obviously. When she mentioned to him that she bought tickets for Shanghai, she figuring that he's going to make a big fuss, he did not make a fuss at all. He said, out just out, 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 out of Germany. What I've seen there, mind you, this was just a strict internment camp. Not a good, not a good place, but not what it was going to be years later. After what I've seen there, it's anywhere but out of Germany. So on February 8th, 1939, we got into a train to go to Italy to pick up the Hakusaki Maru, a Japanese ship, to go to Shanghai. We left February 13, 1939, and made a few stops. We stopped in uh, Port Said, Egypt. We stopped in uh, what is now Sri Lanka, was Colombo. And we stopped in Bombay, now Mumbai. And we stopped in Singapore. And we stopped in Hong Kong on the way to Shanghai and arrived in Shanghai on March 14, 1939. It took a whole month, but we were in a beautiful luxury ship because the only ships that could take would take people to Shanghai at that time were all the cruise ships. The Japanese line, the Lloyd Touristina, which was the Italian line, and the Hapag Lloyd, which was the German line. 
and these were all <coughs> luxuries cruise ship where you had to buy the tickets first class. And we traveled first class. It was a beautiful, beautiful ship. What awaited us in Shanghai was not so first class. We had an idea, but it was the most tremendous culture shock in the world for my parents, I'm sure. For me, being eight of years old, of course, it was an adventure. For them, it was not an adventure. It was a culture shock. We were welcomed by members of an organization still around today, the American Joint Distribution Committee, uh, which is an arm of UJA, with members from America with monies for soup kitchen and monies to help the refugees settle. Nobody knew it would be wave after wave after wave of ships that would be coming in, finally totaling between 18 and 20,000 Jews escaping Nazi Europe. My mother had a lot of foresight. We had to deliver all our valuables, as you heard, but we were allowed all personal possessions. Whatever we wanted to take, all we had to do was make a list. My 12-page list, as a matter of fact, a copy of it, a carbon copy, for those people who remember what carbon <laughs> copies are. I showed carbon paper to my grandchildren the other day. They looked and said, Car carbon paper? <laughs> and I explained to them what it does. So, anyway, she made a few carbon copies. And uh, of one copy, as I said, in the Holocaust Museum in Washington. And everything had to be listed down to two pot holders, two curtains, whatever. <laughs> Uh, whatever you were taking, but you will not take whatever you wanted. So my mother took stuff that she knew she would never use in Shanghai, but would possibly be saleable. She took her furs, her linens, <coughs> her laces, her knickknacks, crystals, <coughs> whatever she could pack with <coughs> suitcases after suitcases and trunks, and etc. We had it, we had it all, and one trunk is still in my garage today, as a matter of fact which my kids keep looking at and want to throw out, and I said, no, you're not throwing it out. And anyway, uh, we brought all that to Shanghai. The Shanghai at that time uh, had a population of about 9 million. As I mentioned, I just came, came back on Tuesday for my third tri trip. There are 25 million people in Shanghai today. <coughs> there were 9 million then, which were mostly Chinese, then there were the Japanese occupation, and many foreigners were there too. Shanghai had been divided into various sectors. The Concession Francaise, which was a uh, residential sector, I like to describe it as the Long Island of Shanghai, beautiful parks like this, and parks like that, and uh, tree-lined streets, and apartment houses, and villas. Then there was the, uh, had been uh, leased from by the French for 99 years. Then came the British Foreign Settlement, which had been leased also from the Chinese for 99 years, and that had all the office buildings, the branch offices of uh, foreign companies, and all the government offices, the main post office, etc., etc. Then there was another sector on the other side of the bridge, on the other side of the Wangpu River, called Hongqiu. And that area was mainly in ruins from the Sino-Japanese War of 1937, and was a total slum area. But however, the joint managed to find dormitories for the refugees to stay there in uh, dormitory style abodes till they could find different kinds of housing. What my mother did, she gave all her the stuff that she brought to the thrift shops of the Iraqi Jews. They were Iraqi Jews who had come from uh, Baghdadi Jews actually who had come in the 1800s, who were super wealthy and super philanthropic. Uh, the names might be familiar to you, Kaduri, Sassoon, and Hardoon. And they immediately supplied monies and soup kitchens and help to the refugees. There was a Russian Jewish community, not as wealthy, but comfortable, who had come after the 17th revolution. My uh, mother gave her items to the Sephardic um, thrift shops, with the proceeds, she bought an apartment in the French concession and established a typewriter business hiring a Chinese mechanic. She went knocking on doors to get the customers and she took care of the business end of the deal. And my father, who had studied to be a typewriter mechanic before leaving Germany, worked with the Chinese mechanic. And then we arranged for my grandmother to come over. The climactic uh, conditions in Shanghai 
very alien to the Western European. I was just there, as I mentioned, and we were there on a particular hot day, which was 110 degrees, and everybody was going like that, and it did not bother me, because I grew up with that. It was hotter than 110. It could be 120 and 130. It was hotter, but I grew used to it. But let me tell you, it was very, very, very hot. Um, the um, sanitary conditions were just as bad. We had to be inoculated against cholera, typhoid, and paratyphoid three times a year, smallpox once a year. We were told uh, water had to be boiled at least five minutes past its boiling point, and the same thing had to be done with all fruit and vegetables. <coughs> of course, now I had to go to school. I had not seen the inside of a classroom since the previous November, and here it was April. Uh, there were various schools that I could be enrolled in. My parents chose to enroll me in the Shanghai Jewish School, which was a British school. Uh, the curriculum was made up in Cambridge, England, sent to Shanghai, meticulously followed. Examination papers were sent to Cambridge for marking and were sent back to Shanghai. And the decision was made in Cambridge whether somebody would be promoted or not, as the case might be. Uh, second language taught was French, and under religion we were taught Hebrew and uh, the prayers. Now, of course, the schools had a problem. Here were all these refugee children from various countries in Europe speaking German, Polish, Hungarian, Czech. Nobody spoke a word of English. So what do you do with all these children in a British school, the curriculum in English, between the, the kids were between the ages of 5 and 13? Well, they stuck us all into kindergarten because it was felt that children learn a language the easiest and the fastest at its most elementary level. And what's more elementary than kindergarten? And I must tell you, I was eight, and within four months I knew English well enough to be put into the grade proper for my age level. The attrition rate among the refugees was tremendous because of the climactic conditions. Those not in the best of health, the young, the old, the sickly, uh, they just uh, couldn't take it. My father's war wound, he had had a stomach wound in Verdun, had acted up while he was in Buchenwald and had been left untreated. And it probably acted up again in Shanghai. We're never really sure what happened. He may have picked up a parasite with it in Buchenwald. He did get sick and he did not survive the climate. He died in 1941 at the age of 43, leaving my grandmother, who was 72 at the time, his mother, my mother, and me. My mother took over the typewriter business together with the Chinese mechanic. Then came Pearl Harbor. For us, it came a day later, because we're on the other side of the international dateline. And let me know, I can still feel it with my jet lag. We're really on the other side. Um, we awoke to a tremendous explosion in the harbor of Shanghai. There were two passenger ships, empty, nobody was on them, but anchored in the Huangpu River, and the Japanese uh, blew them up, effectively blocking the harbor of Shanghai to all outside shipping. The first thing that happened was that all enemy nationals of the Germans and the Japanese were interned in an internment camp where they were to stay for the duration of the war. That meant all Americans, all British, and all nationals of the Benelux countries. At the moment, we, when I use the word we and us, I'm talking about the approximately 18,000 refugees from Europe. We, at the moment, were left alone. We got ration tickets, just like all the other uh, residents, for sugar, for flour, and for rice, and for fabric. The American staff members of the American Joint Distribution Committee were all repatriated to the United States as enemy alien. Only one person was allowed to stay, the big staff member, Laura Margulis, so that she could man the soup kitchen. And of course, we were getting worried. If these people, meaning all these enemy aliens, were being interned, they must have something worse in store for us. Nothing happened. We lived the same as everybody else. 
except my teachers, all my British teachers were interned. We still had our Ru uh, British trained Russian teachers in the school. However, my mother's business, of course, went down the drain because all her customers were now interned. She still had some German customers who did not mind doing business with a Jew and some French customers. So what she decided to do then, she dismissed the Chinese mechanic and she ran the business on her own. And of course, uh, some of you in this room may remember the Royal and Underwood typewriters. They weighed about the same, if not more, than the computers today. And we used to put them in a, in a rickshaw. I would help my mother after school and deliver them up to people. So she took care of minor repairs and cleaning. Then she rented some uh, rooms in our four-room apartment. Well, when uh, Pearl Harbor happened, uh, things really went down the drain in China because everybody being worried what was going to happen. Uh, by nothing happened to us and there were no directives against us till February 1943. In February 1943, the Japanese issued an edict. It was called an, a proclamation. The proclamation stated in part, all those stateless refugees who entered Shanghai after 1937 would have to relocate to a designated area. The designated area they picked was the slum area, a part of the slum area of Hong Kong, virtually a ghetto, even though it wasn't called a ghetto. We had three months in which to relocate. In the proclamation, the word Jew was never mentioned just stateless. We all came to Shanghai, all the refugees, with valid passports, because that's the only way you could get in. However, obviously those passports had not been renewed, couldn't be renewed, so we were all stateless. So this took care of approximately 18,000 Jews who had to relocate. My mother sold uh, the uh, what we had in the French concession in the apartment, and with the proceeds, with three other families, we moved into a slum tenement house. We installed uh, a sink in each room, a cold water sink, and one uh, flush toilet for the ten of us in the house. And now the food shortage, of course, became more acute. There was very little food around. Food kitchens couldn't supply too much anymore because money had not been coming from the United States. And there were all kinds of problems with the uh, sanitary conditions, which were much worse in Hongqiu than in the other places of Shanghai. And uh, the food shortage was bad for everybody. In order for us to leave this so-called ghetto, because it was, called, it was not a ghetto like in Europe, it had you could get a pass to leave the ghetto if you could show the Japanese that you needed to leave the ghetto area in order to make a living. And they put a gentleman in charge of this um, ghetto, a Japanese uh, person by the name of Mr. Goya, whose business was to give out passes or not for you to leave the ghetto. And of course, he gave himself, he was an important person now, he gave himself an important title. King of the Jews, and he would make this decision. Now, our school was outside the ghetto area. Uh, we could have gone to a refugee school that Kaduri had established before the war, which was within the ghetto confines. But kids being kids, you want to stay with your friends. You don't want to change schools. So a bunch of us decided, no, we're going to keep going to the Shanghai Jew School, even though it would take us between two and two and a half hours each way every day to get there walking, tram, bus, airways in between, but we wanted to do it. So we went to Goya, and Goya did give us a pass to go to the school. This is a copy of my pass. Oops. That's a copy of the pass that Goya gave us. And on the back, it had all kinds of uh, dates on it and stamps. It had to be renewed every three months. The last renewal date was September 3rd, 1945, 70 years ago, and that's when the Americans had come to Shanghai to liberate us. 
So this was the last, I did not have to renew this pass. Mm -hmm. Anyway, um, now, uh, so there was no problem going to school. Now my mother had to make some money. She there was, as I said, we were always hungry. There was very little food around. Mm -hmm. So she decided on a ruse. She wrote to one of her French customers and asked her to send a, her a letter saying that she still was servicing her typewriters. On with this letter, she went to see Goya, and uh, he says, what, you typewriter mechanic? She says, yes, it was my husband's business, and I still have a customer, I need a pass. Well, armed with that pass, she went to the, the parts of Shanghai where Westerners did not go. She had no intention of going to service typewriters. And she bought up sundries like scarves and belts and silk stockings, and she brought them back, she put them into her toolbox, she brought them back into the ghetto area to give them to the peddlers on consignment on the street. It did not bring in much money, but put us about half a step above starvation levels. She found various, various ways to put food together. We had a little uh, stove about this high, which we put on the roof. We'd buy coal dust that make, add some water, make little egg-shaped balls and then we'd have put some newspaper in and fan, and fan uh, the stove. She put together uh, cheap noodles that had been swept up in the gutter and we'd separated from the debris and they'd cost very little money and that's how we had food. It became very, very difficult and unfortunately there were people who did die of starvation in the ghetto till money came in from the United States again in 1944. The Japanese distributed every penny, had come in through the joint, distributed every penny via the Jewish Community Center. In early 1945, of course, we heard that the war in, Sh in uh, Germany was over. Germany had, con had conditionally surrendered, and people weren't overly thrilled being in Shanghai, wondering why they didn't stay there if Germany had surrendered. What are we doing in this horrible climate? With the Japanese occupation, we should have stayed wherever home had been. Of course, when a few days later, small words, and they were small words at the time, of course, came trickling in what we had really escaped from. Shanghai wasn't so hot anymore, wasn't so cold anymore, the Japanese weren't so terrible anymore. We felt very lucky indeed that we had not stayed behind, that we had found refuge in Japanese-occupied China. However, we were still at war. We were in the Pacific Theater. We heard about the atomic bombs being dropped. We knew Sh uh, Shanghai was a military target. We were wondering if it was going to be dropped on us. There had been uh, strafings of American planes. We'd see them up in the sky with the Japanese fighter planes. And uh, we were very worried what was going to happen. No, uh, July 17, 1945, the Americans bombed the ghetto area. They did not know it was a ghetto, of course. Their target was the uh, Japanese radio station, which was at the edge of the ghetto area. Uh, 30 refugees got killed, hundreds were wounded, many more Chinese were killed and wounded. Their second target was a uh, military dump and uh, was right across the street from where we lived. And that was their main target, which they missed. If they hadn't missed it, I wouldn't be here telling you the story. Luckily for us, the day was overcast. Well, uh, a few days later, uh, it got very quiet in Shanghai, and a few weeks later after that, it got even more quiet. We didn't see the Japanese, and then the Americans came in beginning of September of 1945. Major General Claire Cheneau came in from Chongqing with Generalissimo Chiang Kai-shek, and we were now liberated, which was 70 years ago. And I must tell you, I feel very, very lucky indeed. As I mentioned before, I'm an only child, and I really created my own family with uh, four children, 12 grandchildren, and two great-grandchildren right now. And uh, mo most of the members of my family, my mother's immediate family, had been murdered. One uncle had gone to England, and he just died at the end of the war. One sister had gone to Palestine. 
everyone else, all her other siblings got murdered with their children and with their grandchildren. So um, I feel very <coughs> lucky indeed that we did found refuge in Shanghai, albeit under Japanese occupation. <coughs> and uh, under the circumstances of being war, we were not treated great. However, uh, I got to make a negative into a positive. They did not kill us. As a matter of fact, one of the stories when I did the research for my book, Ghetto Shanghai, was that we were wondering why we had been put in the ghetto area. We never, we will never know for sure. There were zillions of theories why the Japanese saved us, they allowed us in, etc., etc. But what we do know is that the so-called um, butcher of Warsaw, uh, Meisinger, the Gestapo agent Meisinger, had come to Shanghai in 1942 and had told the um, Japanese um, uh, occupiers that they wanted to get rid of us. And, and so he says, what, what do you mean get rid of them? And he says, well, put them out on ships to sea without food or water or just shoot them. And the Japanese made a compromise with their allies and put us into this so-called designated area, ghetto area, thereby again saving our lives. So this is, this is the story of our survival, and it is uh, part of uh, our legacy. Unfortunately, six million did not survive, and others who did survive survived horrors. We survived. They weren't horrors. They weren't good. They weren't good, but they were not horrors. So again, I want to mention how lucky I am to be here in the United States, tell you that story and I'll be very happy to take questions. Thank you. Anybody have a question or did I, did I tell you everything? <laughs> I'll never be able to tell you everything. Even my book, after I wrote it and revised and revised and revised, I always found something after, ah, I left this out and I left that out. But uh, basically, Yes. You mentioned that the Japanese allowed pass through of money from the United States to the camps. Is that what you put to the ghetto? You mentioned that the Japanese allowed for passage of the money from the United States, who they were at war with, to this to Shanghai. To yes. Shanghai. Yes. That seems odd to me that they would cooperate in any way. Well, they cooperated because they didn't want starving people. Starving people riot. They did not want starving people. Yeah. Uh, we were in a kind of limbo situation. Well, not not oh, sorry. We were in a kind of limbo situation. We technically were not their enemy. We were the so-called enemy of their ally, but not their enemy. They were not anti-Semitic. And they saw no reason to kill us. You know, people usually kill for a reason. Whether it's a, a civilian, whether it's a soldier, you kill for a reason. He's an enemy, he's gonna shoot me, and uh, well, the Nazis didn't have reasons, of course, but uh, that's a different story. But usually people kill for a reason. They had no reason to kill us. What were they gonna do? Go into our apartments and start shooting us? You know, I could walk in the street and a Japanese soldier would be walking next to me with his, uh, all, there was always a raised bayonet when they were, and I had no fear. I didn't think nothing was going to happen to me. A Chinese person had a fear. That was the big difference. Chinese person would cross the street to get away from them, and I've seen things happen. So, uh, but they never bothered us. And I mean, we certainly stood out as a Westerner. They knew who, who we were. So there was, there was no way that we could hide and, and look different, which we didn't. And they never bothered us. And uh, I never had, a, I never had a problem with them. What, their rules and regulations were difficult, annoying, aggravating, but not impossible. I'll tell you what else they did because you mentioned why did they do that? Uh, we had a small synagogue in the ghetto area, a very small one, which, by the way, has now been built into a refugee museum. A wonderful, beautiful refugee museum where they put names on the wall of all the names they could find of people who found refuge. And I found my, my name is on there, my family name and others. They found about 15,000 names they put on there and they had a ceremony. 
uh, for that. So that, that had been the little synagogue. Uh, but come of Rosh Hashanah Yom Kippur, just like anywhere else in the world, people crawl out of the woodwork to go to shul. And uh, so what the Japanese did, right on the outskirts of the ghetto area, across the street, you know, where the ghetto started, they had a movie theater. We were, they let us use the movie theater for Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur. And the women sat up in the balcony and the men sat downstairs and we had our services. All we needed was a ticket, which we got for free, and we were kind of put on an honor system not to go further. And people didn't because, again, we'd, st we'd stand out. They'd know, you know, that we weren't there. And they allowed us to have services. A long answer, right? But I, I think I answered your question. Thank you. Uh, any other questions? Oh, by the way, if anybody's interested in my book, I brought a few copies uh, with me. I'll be glad to autograph them. I'm sorry? How did I get to the United States? Okay. After the war, <laughs> I wrote <laughs> I wrote to that uh, recalcitrant great aunt and said, now there are just two of us, not four of us. Can you send us an affidavit? And I got a letter from her daughter telling me that her mother died during the war. Her husband's a school principal in Brooklyn, and they cannot sponsor us. So... Um, my mother wrote to her brother in England and uh, found out he had just passed away in 1948, but uh, actually he was still alive then. He passed away in 1948. His wife, my mother's sister-in-law, uh, remembered she had a nephew who had emigrated to Lakewood, New Jersey, where he was a cook in a kosher hotel. So she wrote to him and he immediately sent the necessary papers. Never had heard of us before, never knew us, immediately sent the papers. And my mother and I came in March of 1947, this time on German displaced persons quota. And we came by San Francisco, and I will never forget uh, when the ship passed under the Golden Gate Bridge, it was about three in the morning, and we all stood on deck and everybody was crying because we we're so happy to finally, after all those years, to come to the United States. And of course, my mother and I were crying. We had left my father and my grandmother behind. By the way, those graves don't exist anymore because during the Cultural Revolution, uh, the Chinese uh, government of the time built over all Western cemeteries, not just the Jewish ones, the Christian ones also. So there is nothing left there. However, at that time, there was still, of course, the cemetery. So we felt very bad that they couldn't have joined us, but we were very happy to come to the United States. My mother lived to be 93 and a half. First, there's uh, Steve Dubner from Steve Dubner Landscaping. He designed and constructed uh, the beautiful garden that's behind me. Spent hundreds of hours making this happen and to transform the garden into what it is today. Uh, we have our park steward of Arboretum Park, which is Robin Laban. We want to thank her. And also um, Thea Lancicero. Now, Thea Lancicero is a, a, a sculptor, and she made the Anne Frank sculpture that you'll see if you take a walk in the garden. Beautiful, beautiful wedding gown. Her vision was, uh, you know, what Anne Frank would have worn at her wedding if she survived to make it to her wedding. 
So, and, and she wants the, the sculpture to represent, you know, resilience of, of all people. So what, what she had told me was the, the armor-like lace, lace structures are vulnerable, yet fearless. And that's a really great tribute, and it's, it's a beautiful piece of sculpture. You really have to take, uh, take a look at that. And we have to give a big shout out to our general services guys who are here today, who set everything up, and set the sound system, all the chairs, and it, it's perfect. Uh, I have to thank uh, Linda Levine, my legislative secretary, and my legislative aide, Fran Evans, and my intern, Matt Nelson, who all three worked tirelessly to make this a beautiful event. Uh, so let's give them a round of applause. We have to thank Hummel and Hummel of East Northport, who you will uh, partake in their delicious pizza crumb cakes. Really, really good. Uh, and Larkfield Road Starbucks for providing us with coffee. So let's have a very close note to All right, so what we're going to do right now, we're going to uh, reintroduce uh, Hazan Brian Baruch Shemak with the South Huntington Jewish Center, who will offer a, a musical uh, closing for our ceremony. And then we, the rabbi will give a benediction, we will retire the colors, and then we'd like everybody to take a, a wonderful tour of the Anne Frank Garden. So, Hazan. And we welcome all of you to rise as we're about to say the Martyrology Kaddish. So we say the Kaddish every day, uh, perhaps three times a day, especially when you're somebody that's in mourning. And today we remember this reading list of extermination camps and historic sites uh, and great massacres and pogroms that the Jewish people experienced. So interspersed with the words of the Kaddish that are in praise of God's name, we also remember these historic sites, these historic places where we lost so many lives. We pray that the souls of those martyrs of the Jewish people are connected with God. Shirata, Rusha, to 
I give my benediction. One of the first times I met Chazan Shamash was at jury duty. <laughs> and we're both sitting there, you know, there must be 250 people in the room. Chazan Shamash goes up to the front and he comes back and he says, I got out of it, I'm leaving. <laughs> I said, How? So he said, Look, I told him I'm a member of a clergy, my wife is pregnant, and I have to go. And they said, Fine. So I went up there. Now, as a member of the clergy, I can't lie. So I went up there, I said, excuse me, I'm a member of the clergy, and uh, my wife wants to be pregnant. <laughs> I was juror number nine for three days. <laughs> He's a savvy man. Almighty God, Father of all mankind, we pause on this beautiful day to honor the memories of Anne Frank who perished in the Holocaust. And the Holocaust was the worst act of terrorism ever encountered. So we pause to not only the, honor the heroes, some who made the ultimate sacrifice for others, but to also remember Anne and the 1.5 million children who were lost due to starvation, sickness, gas chambers, plain cruelty. We pray, dear God, to remember and embrace these children. And we ask you, dear God, at the same time to embrace our children. We ask you, dear God, to protect those children in heaven. And we ask you to protect our children. Nurture them and nurture our kids. We ask you, dear God, to look out for our children's best interest as any father would. Almighty God, we ask you to give us the guidance, the, the seho, the sense to be able to rear our children to be upright, moral, and be beautiful and honest citizens of our country or any country, citizens that you would be proud of. We pray once again to sustain the leaders of the good side, who fight in their efforts to remove the dark side of the force, the shadows, the terror, the fear, which lurks over peace-abiding peoples. Hey, help all nations of our world to realize the cruelty of 
bloodshed and the futility of terrorism. Inspire them to labor with all their might to banish conflict, strife, and to finally, once and for all, establish world peace. And let us say, God bless you. Thank you, Rabbi. Everybody, thank you very much for coming. Make sure you take a tour of the Anne Frank Garden here at, Ar at Arboretum Park. Have some refreshments. And now, uh, Jewish War, War veterans, please retire the colors. Thank you everybody very much for coming, thank you.